Paul Ferraro from Raytheon Company, based here in Portsmouth, and, and thank you again for, for staying for the duration of our event uh, over the last couple days. And, and I want to thank the Cynidia uh, leadership here for putting on such an outstanding lineup over the last couple of days. Quick round of applause for them, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, so I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker for the day. Uh, Vice Admiral retired Mike Connor. I'm sure many of us in the room know him and, and know the great work that he's done while he was in active duty, uh, recently retired. So just a quick background on Mike. Uh, Mike Connor is president and CEO of Thayer Man, providing uh, provider of marine robotic solutions for both government and industry. Mr. Connor founded this company in January of 2016 to accelerate United States' ability to effectively and efficiently monitor ocean activity using autonomous systems. Mr. Connor rose to the rank of Vice Admiral in the United States Navy over a 35-year career. He commanded at the ship, squadron, and task force level. His assignments included commander of the USS Seawolf, a nuclear-powered attack submarine, submarine squadron eight, undersea forces in the Western Pacific and Arabian Gulf, the United States Submarine Force, and NATO's Allied Submarine Command. He led the U.S. Navy Submarine Force move into robotic undersea systems, achieving key milestones, including the first operational deployment and recovery of an unmanned system from a submarine. Mr. Connor retired from the Navy in 2015. Mike graduated from Bowdoin College. He is a man scholar and graduate of the Naval, graduate of the Naval War College with a Master's of Arts in National Security Affairs and Strategic Studies. Please join me in welcoming Mike Connor. Th thank you, Paul, for that kind introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Cynidia and the Platinum sponsors, uh, General Dynamics and Raytheon, and then especially uh, the work of uh, Tim Del Judas for uh, making this such a success. Uh, I I'm always worried when I'm the last speaker in a three-day conference, I'm actually surprised that so many of you are here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, as Paul said, um, I sort of jumped the fence here a little bit. Um, I was on the government side of this thing, and now I'm on the uh, the industry side is a, is a very small player. Um, I'd like to credit the person in the, who asked the question about uh, venture-backed businesses competing for SBIR grants, because that's exactly what I did. I, when I was, uh, left the Navy, I sat around deciding what to do with my life. I decided I thought I had some, knew of some things that needed to be done. I did some reading about how to get stuff done quickly and came up with the idea that you go down to Wall Street, you raise some money, you pitch your idea, and, and then you get moving and you do it quickly. And, and that's what I did. And uh, so now I'm excluded from SBIR grants, Matt. I don't know what to do. No, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> um, but anyway, the way we navigate in this turf is, uh, is, is interesting, it's exciting, and I'd like to tell you sort of the perspective I've evolved to uh, over the last year or so. So uh, next slide, please. So fir first of all, as uh, Congressman uh, Cicilline said this morning, uh, the world is a very busy place. The demands on the U.S. to uh, ensure the health of the world economy, uh, ensure the rights of citizens, uh, the interests of our allies, it has never been more diverse. Uh, there are many, many things we need to do, and we flat out can't do them all with the current structure that we have. Uh, my job for the last three years running the submarine force uh, evolved largely around providing about 13 forward submarines to monitor the things that our country wanted us to look at. And uh, frankly, 13 wasn't enough. The demands for information uh, span much wider than that. And so we really need a different model, I think, going forward where we can do some things in other ways. Certainly not everything. There are things that only ships, aircraft, and submarines can do. And we need to look at the, this role that autonomy can play and look at what missions we can pick up, perhaps more efficiently and effectively, to allow them to do the things that only they can do. So uh, next slide, please. As almost every speaker has mentioned, um, things are changing, and they're changing very quickly. 
the things that we can do now are radically different than what we could do five years ago. And there's just a couple of examples on this slide. You know, in my business, we use a little, about a two inch by two inch circuit card that consumes four watts that does essentially the same towed array processing as a submarine combat system. You know, I grew up in a world where I used to keep my coffee cup warm by putting it on top of the X7 uh, because of all the heat that that thing was throwing off. And when someone told me that you could run a towed array for about four watts and process it for about another four watts, I was dumbfounded. But at the same time, um, I came to the realization that that sure opens up a lot of opportunity space in the unmanned system world. And then similarly, the, uh, the power we have available is changing rapidly. That picture you see in red is a, a battery made by a company that's one of these MIT spin-offs we were talking about. It's a uh, aluminum seawater battery. It has about, uh, it was designed to have about 10 times the energy density of lithium ion. And uh, I've been following the progress of this thing. It's more like 15 to 20 as we stand here today. And uh, if you can take a vehicle and have 15 to 20 times the energy density of lithium ion, that totally changes your concept of operations for what you can do with that vehicle. And then there are other companies, again, they're in this area, they're MIT spinoffs who think maybe they have that type of energy density in something that is not single use, but is rechargeable. So again, um, the, the, what we can do now is very different than five years ago and will be radically different five years from now. The question is, can we handle it? And I think we've all uh, mentioned that, you know, can the acquisition uh, system digest this pace of change? And, uh, and as some of the speakers said this morning, we have some work to do. Um, but there, there are glimmers of hope. And there's some specific things we can do. What if we just simply redefined existing systems, take your submarine combat system, to include the things it would rely upon that are maybe hundreds of miles away, but we're gathering information that fed your ship. Uh, maybe we wouldn't need a new program. Maybe it becomes, you know, busy four or, you know, ARCI something. But the point is, sometimes the tools that we create when we create a budget we tend to restrict ourselves, sometimes because we don't want someone else to reach into our program with a better idea. And I say, I'm speaking sort of as a former government guy, you, you can fence off your program by narrowly defining it. But when you do that, you maybe close off the opportunity for people with newer and better ideas to help you get your job done. So just some things to think about. We need to get ready for that. That was certainly brought out at this conference. Next slide, please. Okay, the next... Uh, thing that we talked about a lot this week was artificial intelligence and how that will drive system design. And, you know, we can get into that on a number of levels and maybe we can start with modest goals and expand over time as our ability to manage artificial intelligence improves. But certainly at the beginning, we can do simple things like, like have a network of sensors that manages itself when one of the sensors goes down. And then we can move on to things like better forms of uh, contact recognition. Now, I've been fascinated by some things I've seen up at Woods Hole and the ability of uh, artificial intelligence to, on the one hand, recognize you know, precise contacts uh, visually and using technology that, that I think would, could transform how we recognize things acoustically depending how we present acoustic information. But certainly the things that we do to do acoustic contact recognition are really not more sophisticated than, say, facial recognition software, which has gone very far. So can we apply some of those techniques and present our acoustic information in a different way uh, so that it becomes something very different from this, you know, matching known exact things based on things you heard before that you can, you can be smarter. And then you get into this thing where you know, many in this room have, have participated personally in uh, intelligence and surveillance reconnaissance operations, the fundamental purpose of which was to let senior leaders know if something was different was going on. And AI, as it turns out, is pretty good over time at determining what normal looks like by day, by hour, by time of year. 
And then uh, just saying, hey, I don't know what this is, but this is different, and maybe someone besides this computer ought to take a look at it. And that, that is doable as we go up. And then as we go up, if we can start putting context behind large bodies of information that we gather, maybe we can start doing some of these operational assessment roles. Maybe we know the difference between a troop movement from an exercise and an impending evasion. Or at least we can send alerters that are autonomous that would quickly say, this might be the case. All right, next slide. I was watching the guys up on stage yesterday struggle mightily with uh, what I'm about to say. Um, I think I could probably get all hands to go up to say that robotic systems will be more relevant in the future than in the past. But if, you know, the, if like there's only like 1.0 relevance to be had, if the robotic thing is more relevant, the things that, that we used to ride in are actually a little less relevant. Get over it. That's what I'm trying to say. It's, it's, uh, they will enhance what we do, uh, but at the end of the day, autonomous and robotic things are on a track to take a more prevalent role in how we do, how quickly we do it, how efficiently we do it, and how successfully we do it. So let's just move on. And uh, to a certain degree in aviation, if you look at the, the, the pointy end of the fight on terror and the ratio of the, uh, of the direct action that is being now done with remote systems, not autonomous systems, but remote systems, it gets bigger and bigger for a whole bunch of good reasons. The whole risk calculation is much more favorable. Uh, there are no down pilots. When's the last time you heard of a pilot being caught behind enemy lines? It just doesn't happen. And the precision of the effects that we deliver are as, uh, as good as they are. So uh, I'm not saying there's not a role for, for manned uh, ships, aircraft, and submarines, but certainly the space that we can do, that we can expand for unmanned is, is huge. And in many cases, the risk calculation for using unmanned systems because of water depth, mission risk, uh, loss of life, loss of the value of assets that, that would be lost if we uh, are not successful, it changes everything. So let's just figure out how to do that. Now, I think there's a problem uh, that we have. This, I think that argument, I, I probably, if we went out in the, in the hallway, I wouldn't get a lot of argument about that. But if you're some small company trying to build autonomous, unmanned capability and things that don't cost a lot of money at a unit level, um, you might find yourself in a difficult spot carrying your message forward to government. You know, um, when I was a submarine force commander, I would come up with, you know, what I thought the justification um, for the next thing we needed to do in the submarine force was and the next investment. And, uh, and it was pretty successful. But I knew in my heart of hearts, it wasn't successful because of me and what I said. It was successful because there was this network of people many of whom are in this room, who knew how to take that argument, get it to the Congress, to the Department of Defense decision makers and so forth, and, and make the case. Because they talk to people that, you know, that Matt Winter can't talk to, or at least it, can't talk to in the same, you know, scenario. Same, so, so if you believe in all this stuff that we've been talking about for the last couple days, I, I suggest that um, we take things like Cynidia and learn how to turn it into an even more powerful advocacy network for the good things that you think need to be done. I hope that's, uh, that's making sense because if you do that, you will develop the capabilities much more effectively. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I think we need a new language. Uh, the last time I wrote a strategy in, in uniform, I talked about platforms and payloads. And the platforms, they were submarines, they were ships, they were aircraft, pretty much all doing the undersea warfare mission. And the payloads were the little things we dropped off them. As I tried to study some of the faster moving segments of our economy, the thing that they call the platform is the computer network. It's the Uber, you know, engine that coordinates phone calls and your, your, takes your cell phone and connects it to a driver who's ready to take you where you want to go. 
It's not the Uber driver in his car. Those are notes. And in the future, uh, things like ships and airplanes and uh, submarines will become, and the robotic things that we use, will all become more like nodes in a system. And then we're going to have this horrible cultural uh, issue when one of those uh, info dominance badge wearing guys who doesn't even have wings or dolphins or surface warfare pin is maybe running the show because he's really good, he or she is really good at running the platform that actually is what makes everything happen in this world of smaller connected things. And we will struggle mightily with the uh, implications of that for the authority of the, of the you know, strike group commander or squadron commander and so forth. Um, but we can figure it out, so let's give it a go. Next slide. Uh, the next thing I think that's going to rock our world is, uh, is the increasing importance of command and control of vast networks of naval things uh, from shore. It just, you know, it just, it's not what we grew up thinking. But the truth is, even if you're in our probably a most dominant awareness platform, the aircraft carrier, with all those feeds they have, the truth is, in the world we live in today, they have only a partial picture. And it gets worse and worse as you get down to the submarine and the ship, and then even worse as you get down to sort of the unmanned thing, right? They only know pieces and parts of what's around them. But if they can match the pieces and parts of what they know is going on around them with this flood of information that's coming from all the other things that are scrounging for information, uh, they'd be in a much better position to act. And the person who is most likely best able to make that call, I think, will probably be on land somewhere with all the feeds coming to them. And that will be different, and that will be a cultural issue uh, to be overcome. OK. Um, next slide. Here's a cultural issue. Our hardware asks too long. You know, I just talked to Kurt Hesch. He makes these submarines. They last. They're promised for 33 years, but they, they go more. We've made the SSBNs last for 42. You know, it's awesome, maybe. Uh, but the issue is, because of that, and it, you know, as time goes on, the stuff that goes inside that ship is evolving faster and faster. And we've made some adaptations for that with, you know, COTS-based technology, swaps out quick. But, uh, so this is Mike Connor's personal opinion, is I think we overshot the mark in how long we make things last. And we ought to look at making things last a shorter period of time so we have less tech refresh cycles in the length of a single hull, of whether it's an aircraft or a, a ship. Um, maybe save some money in the process and, and maybe become more adaptable in the process. And, and there are side effects. There are side effects if the average life of a ship is 40 years and the average uh, career of a person designing and building a ship is 35 years. Um, you know, no one gets to sort of learn from the first time they did it or the time they did it at a low level to, to do it again at a higher level. We need more turnover to keep our industrial base and our design base uh, vibrant so that they're always designing, always building, always evolving. I know we have some mitigations in place, but to a large degree, a lot of those things would be solved by building uh, things with a shorter half-life. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> I've put up a, uh, a little model here of, uh, of what is the Google double-click algorithm. Uh, and the point being that those are the people who, you know, troll your email. Uh, you talk about going on a camping trip next weekend or whatever it is you talk about doing next weekend. And they will send you custom tailored advertising to sell you a tent or, you know, whatever uh, within seconds because they know where you are. They know what you're interested in. And they've got a rapid reaction way of, of delivering something to you. In that case, what they deliver you is, a, is the advertising. But, but it could be, you know, Amazon delivering you your package 
uh, very quickly based on, based on your click search. And what all this stuff evolves is, is the gathering of information at a high rate of speed, the assimilation of that in some central location, and then the targeting of effects based on that information also happening very rapidly. And that is not a whole lot different than what we do. So maybe we need to prepare ourselves for a world in which, say, intelligence is distributed to ships, uh, unmanned vehicles, whatever, troops on shore, uh, based at very high speed, without human intervention, and based on their, perhaps, geographic location, assigned mission, and some artificial intelligence that, that basically assesses what it is that they need to know. And maybe what the people should be doing is overseeing that process, tweaking it based on feedback they get from users, but not being in the loop to decide who gets what, because when you do that, you slow the system down. And we're already living in a, in a world of fleeting targets who stick their head above the grass for minutes. And if you can't respond in another few minutes uh, with the proper effect in the proper place, uh, the opportunity is lost, perhaps for days, months, years. So uh, we need to think about that. So next slide. The, uh, all the things I've talked to you about so far have been come out of a book by a guy named Kevin Kelly, at least the general principles have. And the, the book is called The Inevitable. And it talks about these things like artificial intelligence and, and remixing and so forth, which, which I'll talk about here, as inevitable things that will happen that will determine success or failure in the future. So remixing uh, really involves taking information from multiple sources, assimilating it, and then maybe adding some quality on top of it. And, and maybe quality might be things like commander's guidance, such that you can take an intel stream and, and add something that allows a person or a vehicle or a, uh, a ship to, to actually take action based on this information that was gathered mere seconds ago. And uh, it's, it would be very interesting, but again, that is what will allow us to have the, uh, the speed necessary to respond in the future. Next slide. Okay, and this is, I, I actually dug up a slide off a Subland website that I'm somewhat familiar with, just to sort of recast the, uh, the various time circles we work in. And on the outer side, we have the, you know, the ship design, and that would also be sort of an aircraft design timeline, but it's a, a decades-long thing. Necessarily so, because of the, uh, the very precise quality that we require in, in those platforms. Uh, inside that, though, we start getting in these tighter and tighter circles where um, the trade-off between uh, time and quality is, is variable and should be variable. And the risks that we're willing to take as we get into things that are less expensive, uh, don't have people on them, um, don't cause any serious damage if someone bumps into them or they bump into someone, we ought to have a pretty low threshold for what it takes to get that capability delivered. Because if we can deliver the capability to the theater, um, we have something. The downside, if it isn't perfect, is relatively low. And since most of that stuff has a very short uh, lifespan, uh, we have this opportunity by taking risk and going early to improve at a much higher rate than if we try to set very high requirements that are decades away. So as we, you know, as we look at things like you know, unmanned vehicles, whether it's a fleet modular AUV or perhaps the LDUV that we mentioned earlier, we should make sure we keep the same balance between speed, uh, cost, and uh, quality and rigor of testing. We can afford to make a few mistakes along the way. And if we do that, it's my belief that the net, pro net forward progress that we make from an approach like that, which will involve a number of stumbles here and there, will be far better than if we try too hard at the early stages to make everything just right and perfect. So I encourage you to take some risk. Um, have a few failures from time to time. It's okay 
as long as you're having those with the things in the inner circles. Uh, next slide. So today we certainly got uh, affirmation from people like uh, Admiral Winter and Mr. Welby and yesterday from uh, Secretary Kendall and General Kelly that, uh, you know, DOD gets this, that they understand that they need to be more, that we need to be more innovative, uh, maybe a little more entrepreneurial, and, and they're starting the wheels in motion to make that happen. Uh, some of my business partners are Silicon Valley based, and, and they give me Silicon Valley uh, feedback once in a while on things like, uh, like DIUX, and they see uh, DIUX 2.0 as a major step forward because people are coming with uh, maybe a little more adventuresome spirit, a little more actual money behind them. So in the, if you have money behind you, apparently you have more credibility out there than if you're you know, negotiating uh, introductions to parties. So, so good move uh, to whoever, whoever decided to do that. And then uh, in a similar vein, the uh, opening up an office in Boston, um, given Jim Bellingham's uh, map yesterday on the density of the robotics industry in the Northeast and the expertise that, uh, that uh, exists up here, um, another good move. And uh, hopefully we'll see the results of that pretty soon. So uh, next slide. So uh, this is another theme of this book by, by Kevin Kelly. He said, it's good to be alive in 2016. And what he meant by that is a lot of people sit around in the IT business apparently and go, if only I knew uh, in 1994 or 1987 where this whole internet thing was going, um, boy, I, I could have made some good moves and, and, and done very, very well. And, and his point is, if you're looking at a future for your business that is based on autonomy, and processing power and, the, and the things like that, there has never been a time to be in that business than right now because we're really at the cusp of, of some good things that are going. So uh, with that, I'd just like to say in closing that uh, to the uh, Southeastern New England Defense Industrial Association that when I retired after 35 years in the Navy and decided um, where I wanted to live and what I wanted to do, um, I decided that I would locate to southeastern New England to be a small business person uh, working in the defense area on autonomous systems. So uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad I was able to find you, and I look forward to working with all of you uh, in the coming years. Thank you. Yeah, Mike, before you sit down, do uh, we have any questions for uh, Vice Admiral Connor? I'm sure there's got to be one or two out there somewhere. Joe? Sure. And Mike, thank you for that very provocative uh, uh, presentation here. Uh, it seems a lot of what you talked about is what Admiral Winter had called the business of science. Uh, I see a lot of activity that's happening on the technology front. I think that the business of science is kind of lagging uh, behind there. What's your view on how fast the pace we're moving to make some of these transformational changes that you talked about? Well, I guess my basic point would, uh, would follow along the, the uh, question that I asked uh, Congressman Cicilline this morning. Uh, and that is that uh, if, if we're starting to embrace technologies that will have a two to three year technology cycle just due to the pace at which it's moving ahead and, and there's nothing magical about, uh, about the U.S. as far as uh, having an exclusive right to leverage autonomy, we're, we're actually approaching a battle that, you know, a technological battle that will play out in military terms where, where one of the strategic um, strengths of either side will be their ability to sort of to change the uh, change their face to the enemy by in introducing new capabilities and challenges very rapidly and so if we don't uh, find a way to actually do the things that we say we want to do in the acquisition world 
to identify technologies, to, to uh, leverage them quickly, and, and not through a, a multi-year uh, budget cycle just to get started, um, then by definition we will lose because the adversary may not have those same time restrictions in terms of just getting started. So we, we have to really um, bring to almost zero the, the difference in time between when all these smart people in this room can innovate and, and how fast they actually do innovate based on the mechanisms that we, that we provide to, to fund the innovation. And so, you know, Matt Winter talked about that. What he wants is, is money that has a lot of freedom so when they see something, they can, they can jump on it. And um, that's not always the way it works. A lot of that money is, is, has handcuffs on it when it arrives on this doorstep, uh, and that's a problem. And then I think another area that we need to look at there is, is if the money gets given to program managers, and um, program managers are highly incentivized right now to be risk averse. Um, I gave some, some testimony after I retired to the, the Congress last year, and, uh, and they asked all the right questions, and I, I basically told them that they need to let their program managers take more risk and fail once in a while. And, you know, some of them got it. One guy gave me a lecture. He said, look, we need to have accountability for program managers to meet the goals that are set. And, you know, that sounds perfect, except that when you, when you say those words, um, they will give you a set of goals that they can ensure they will meet, which means they're not trying hard enough, they're not taking enough risk. And then nowhere in that conversation does uh, it come up, what about the accountability that we have as a Navy and a nation to move forward as quickly as we can, or to, to make overall progress, not just to not make mistakes. If you go to work in the morning with priority one, not making a mistake, you're not going to, you know, that can't be the top priority. You have to be, the priority has to be getting stuff done, moving forward, and, and bringing out new gear. Mike. Just before he starts, I, I've, uh, I haven't given a speech in the last five years that I haven't been challenged by Mike, so I'm ready for you, man. <laughs> so, um, I, was, I was fascinated by your comments about the service life. Um, Certainly the surface Navy has gone down this path, maybe prematurely, but with the LCS class, it was intended to be a 20-year 20, 20 service life ship. It was intended to be uh, something you could adapt easily, plug in easily, change capabilities quickly, and you see how this is turning out, both in, on the Hill, in DOD today. Uh, the Navy certainly has taken its bumps and bruises over this. I'm curious how you respond to that and um, has, has, have you socialized any, any of your comments about the service life with your submarine brethren? I haven't. See, I used to have to socialize all my comments and I don't do that anymore, so I don't. <laughs> <coughs> um, but, you know, the, uh, I'm not sure that the LC, you know, people would say, well, LCS was a bad idea, it should have had a frigate or something like that. Um, I'm not so sure that, I don't think that was a mistake. Uh, I, I think it was an aggressive move. Um, it might have been a better move if we had done what we said we were going to do, which is down select to one, let there be a winner and a loser, let the winner make, make a lot of money, let the loser figure out why he lost, and I don't, I don't even know which companies are which, so don't, don't slash my tires. <coughs> but um, but uh, and that was the principle, right? It, it was, we're going to have a competition and someone's going to win. And, and don't go bring up LDUV again because, you know, people have asked me about that too. So, but, but the idea is when you, when you, you know, that was a, I don't think that was a bad idea. And I've been aboard both LCS classes and there's a lot of good there. Uh, you know, open space on a ship that goes fast, um, not a bad idea. It, there's a lot there. Uh, so, so I, I, I'm not going to jump on board, you know, beating up LCS because, of, you know, one of the things Admiral Greenwood said, when we, we put some in uh, Singapore, uh, when we, you know, it was sort of a, a, a prototype deployment, so to speak, but uh, someone said, well, will they be highly effective? I said, well, he said they'll be a lot more effective than the ships we have in Singapore today because we didn't have any. And sometimes that's the choice that we have. It's having something that is not what we dreamed for 
but it's something in a place we didn't have something before. And then there's that whole issue of it, maybe it's at a better level to interact with some of the, com the countries there and their capabilities and their endurance. It doesn't have to keep up with an aircraft carrier. Can it keep up with a Malaysian frigate, for example? If so, that might be a good match. So, uh, so anyway, uh, that's, I guess that's, that's my answer to that. And as far as, you know, the, the engineers from Electric Boat can tell you more about you know, what it takes to make a ship last 40 years, but it's not easy. And the maintenance isn't easy. And um, right now, one of the limiting factors, for example, on submarine availability isn't the number that we have, it's the number that we're getting through depot maintenance. And I think aviation has a very similar issue. Uh, so, so uh, you know, at some point, if, we didn't, if they didn't have to last so long, they wouldn't have as many depot maintenance visits and they'd be a bit better matched with the capacity we have to do that. Sir. Nope, thought I saw your hand up over that way. Okay, thank you very much. I say, be, before you go, let me give you one of our officially zero-valued Sinidia coins. The coveted coin. Thank you very much for rounding out an outstanding group of speakers. But Cindy, I'm so glad that you found us. You started your new company, and, and, and thank you very much. Insightful as always, and I appreciate your time, Mike. Thank you. Thank you.